I decided to write down my memories in a journal before we met each day and talk. I informed Dr. Caselli. It is so hard for me to remember things in the moment, so recording them beforehand seems prudent to me, I told him. When we meet, I will go over my notes and then we can talk about whatever you want relating to them. I believe that is what you've asked me to do, right? Dr. Caselli responded, That is right. It is a good idea to document your thoughts and memories. Would you be willing to give me a copy of them as we proceed? It would save me some time writing down everything that you say. I nodded and agreed that the doctor could copy my memory notes and told him that they sounded more like a lifelong post-mortem diary or an evolving living diary. And perhaps they could form a basis of a book or some anthology someday. Caselli chuckled at my post-mortem diary. Hmm. Funny, Richard. You sound like an engineer, performing a post-mortem analysis of your life. Please proceed. Doctor, I also think my memory notes may be therapeutic for me. You know, even if I cry and sob as I write them, which I had to tell you I do, I feel good about recording my life's journey, kind of like for posterity and maybe a legacy. Maybe they can be made into a television series or a movie I have imagined for myself. And my life's quest will conclude with making humankind better after all. Well, why not hope for storytellers to appreciate my life and the tale of hell difficulty enough that they might want to retell it themselves? Maybe in their own words. Maybe across other art forms and mediums. I don't know. The future's unknown. Of course, of course, I imagine revealing my hope for influencing people's perspectives to Dr. Caselli, even if it was for good and hubris, maybe, to think that I could make a difference in the world that had turned against me so aggressively, but I feared Caselli might think instead that I was just a conceited a-hole, potential sociopath, and hold everything I said further against me. I already said enough, I think, so... I shut up. In between the sessions, I attempted to recall my memories spanning birth to childhood to young adult and beyond. I thought it was important to explain the challenges that I had faced in doing so. While I typed my memories so they would be ready the next day to discuss with Dr. Caselli and his gang of shrinks, I found myself frequently confused. I would write an idea and think of another idea usually related in some tangential way to the current idea. If I did not stop immediately and write down the new idea, I would forget it within 5 to 15 seconds. But after writing the new idea down, I usually lost focus on the prior idea that I was writing. And so, I had to reread the prior section to remember what I had been writing before the new idea appeared, disrupting that idea. If no idea ever emerged, I was able to make some progress on the current memory. But if another new memory emerged, the entire document became confused because I had to document the new idea in the whole loop, almost like it was a recursive, endless loop. So it was very difficult for me to actually get a single idea down, clearly with a beginning and an end. Throughout my life, I have metaphorically put unpleasant or terrible experiences into bottles and sealed them and placed them high up on an out of sight shelf in the back of my mind. The idea was to not forget, so they were there to learn from, but also to suppress any negative emotions or feelings so that I would not be held back or limited by them. That way, knowledge was useful, never destructive. As I recall ancient memories, some of my memory bottle seals have been opened. Some have even broken. The result is that I cry. Tears flow, sobs come out. I do not know how or why it is now happening to me. I have controlled them with my bottles forever, for my entire life. As my mind degenerates, so does my emotional control. 
I suffer severe emotional lability. Remembering things hurts. My brain recoils at the exposure of long buried horrors and nightmares. It seems my neurodegeneration has made me vulnerable to things that I felt I once tamed. Let me describe my residence jail cell. Outside the psych session jail cell. Everything was a jail cell in my new home in Scottsdale Psychiatric Institute for the Criminally Insane. In other words, the loony bin, the nut house, the psych ward, if I'm trying to be nice about it. Back to my room. My room was a Spartan, simple, rectangular room with a plain metal frame bed, overstuffed vinyl visitor chair, and a high school-like student's desk with integrated chair and tabletop. Attached to the tabletop with a steel cable was a laptop with keyboard and trackpad. The furniture was bolted through industrial vinyl flooring to its underlying concrete foundation. The walls and ceiling had a rubberized, tear-resistant, impact-proof sealant like a paint that was so thick, which I suppose was the equivalent to old-school padded walls in a loony bin cell. Yeah, I was the crazy guy inside the loony bin. That's what I clearly was, and that's the room I was in. The room sported throwback phosphorant light tubes that irritatingly flickered slightly continuously. If I did not suffer migraines already, the relentless flicker certainly would have induced them. It was inhumane to lock someone in a room with a constant fluorescent shimmer. At least that's what I think. The room's only natural light came into the room from a single sealed two by three cinder block glass window which let diffused, dimmed light in with nothing visible outside through its milky-tinted, almost opaque glass. There was a shared bathroom outside the room in a hall that connected other psych ward rooms, or should I say jail cells. But to use the bathroom, you had to press an intercom button so you could ask someone if they would unlock your door and then unlock the bathroom door and escort you to the bathroom so that you might do your business. There was no privacy in this hellscape of a psych ward. My bottom line is to you, my room felt very insulated, if not outright isolated, and it engendered headaches and agitation with its flickering lights. Being in the room felt like existing in a perpetual waiting room, wondering when someone might show up to question you, direct you, summon you, or even just feed you. In a lot of ways, I was a human pet to the doctors. They could play with me whenever they wanted, however they saw fit, and they could put me away. Worse, I was in a zoo, and the psychiatrists were gonna decide what they're gonna do with me. Either way, I was a captive and I was awaiting the attention of these mighty psychiatrist masters of mine. There was a tablet with a stylus available on request for artistic expression and entertainment, mostly to draw pictures and handwrite things. It was a doodle and an art pastime distractor. The tablet could transfer any images and doodles though to the mounted desktop laptop for manipulation or even printing. A printer was available upon request as well for a short amount of time to temporarily grant access so you could print over the network to a printer. It was great. It turned out you could also share the files through that computer to the medical team. You could back them up to a network storage device. You could even print the pictures, not just the text. It was a really nice computer setup. The computer had no internet connection though or any access to any of the hospital's networks unless they specifically attached it. The hospital staff accessed the stored files on the network though themselves anytime they wanted to. So I knew at some point the files would leave my isolated patient network and enter their not so isolated network. Unlikely it was a USB drive or manual file copy I had surmised for them. Most likely, the hospital has a way to access all the network data through its subnet, and so I should just 
be able to reverse that someday and get access to the doctor's files. At least that's what I speculated. I just had to make sure they connected it for me to upload before I could download. Anyway, those are my ideas. I'm sure they're inappropriate, but I'm in a psych ward. What do you expect? You know, I think they're worth talking about that stuff later. I want to say something else I discovered, though. A horrific truth. I said I didn't have privacy. Wow, did I have no privacy at all. Yes, I later discovered that they recorded and saved every single doodle, every word that I ever did. So they would review it and assess it at their convenience without me knowing. It didn't matter if I transferred that image to the tablet. It always transferred it to them. Once I knew that they were Orwellian watching me all the time, I felt deceived and violated. It was like I was thrown into George Orwell's 1984 book, New Speak, where everything was inverted in definition and conflicted with reality and outright common sense made no sense and where everything I did was monitored and controlled by Big Brother. They wanted to control my thoughts, my feelings, with coping techniques and drugs. They wanted to control me by taking away all of my freedoms, my rights, my liberty. They wanted to control me by making my life totally worthless and without a future. They wanted to cancel me right now, and unless I did what they said, I'd never be free. They wanted me to have no choice but to think and do exactly as they directed me to. I have found that it is possible for me to write five to eight first pass draft pages per day with a lot of those stops and starts and resets. I learned that word processors have evolved to amazing real-time spell and grammar checking. So as I typed words, it told me to fix the spelling, the tense, or grammar right there. It wasn't perfect, but it was at least 99% or better, right? Far more accurate than I have become with my degenerated brain. Turns out I needed that tool. The tool even recommended alternative wording to avoid repetition. <laughs> it called out potentially offensive words to people. I imagine Dr. Caselli would appreciate that. It was like having a mini publisher editor right there previewing everything right in real time as I typed. It was invaluable and possibly necessary for me to successfully write my memories down. I tried to think of times in my life that had a story or a nugget worth talking about to have a starting point, maybe something of interest. The approach worked out pretty well because it gave me a starting place with a broad idea, like how I became a hacker. Other techniques to remember things included seeking out memorabilia and artifacts from my career, childhood, trophies, photos, cards, emails. They worked the best by giving strong memory stimulus through powerful moments in my life, reinforced with something that at one time was physical. All I had to do was remember these things and so much more unraveled and I could discover and remember other things. Once I had a core idea, it felt like it was a major tree branch extending off the side of my brain like a big trunk, a trunk of knowledge. As I remembered things, it was like traversing smaller branches off that big main branch of knowledge. And from there, tree branch leaves represented smaller detailed memories that previously I could not remember until I had traversed that big trunk out across that big branch until I got to those memory leaves. Writing my own memories has been a different journey in itself than just writing a story because of my inability to remember, my inability to process things well. The idea that I can't even maintain concurrent ideas and tasks is overwhelming, and that makes it especially hard to write down memories. My solution to these difficulties is just to take the time that I need to think and write and take notes and write some more 
and maybe edit and do it again. I afford myself the right to forget sections and even misremember some things in hopes that I will recall the full and accurate details shortly later and correctly, and then I can go back and remedy the mistakes. It is and was important for me to get the stuff down, and then I can organize, refine, and polish it. It was obvious, though, that I no longer have the ability to just remember events in my life without external prompting or recollection triggers or artifacts. I needed help to remember my own life story. I found myself looking at photos from my home of a glory wall with framed copies of my games, awards, and the like that I had received throughout my life. I likewise reviewed my resume and LinkedIn for career social media, and I searched the internet. Oh, and I did search the internet a lot. In the end, I am proud of how much I was able to recall so that I could write my autobiographical memories in hell difficulty. Even if it took me so very long to remember and write it, I believe it's worth it. I'm glad I did it. Another hard thing to describe for me is how my brain reacts to its recognizing its own short circuit failures to process anything. As an example, when I lose track of what I am doing or forget a topic I was thinking about, I feel so bad about myself. My anxiety flares up and sometimes it goes so far through the roof where I must just go lay down just to calm down. And anyone who dares to disturb me when I am calming down is unfortunately greeted with a raging Richard. Yeah, it's third person because I don't rage like that, but this Richard does. It's like a dog that has his food taken. He just kind of goes crazy. I likewise end up feeling similarly bad and anxiety laden following a PBA crying episode or any emotional ability outburst. When these brain failures happen, I experience a kind of pain. It is not physical or emotional pain. It is like a resonating tone, not literally an audible tone in my head, but it's a thing that permeates all thinking, all thought. It feels like a pressure in my forehead, on and within my ears, on and within my temples, on my neck, down my shoulders, through my arms and hands. It can extend to my thighs and calves, even to my feet and toes in extreme situations. And all of this is not physical. It is phantom, like a phantom psychological tormenting pain. I cannot describe how phantom psychological pain feels. It's just something that you experience. I can only attempt to describe similarities with other emotions and feelings. The phantom psychological pain feels like my mind is experiencing fingernails scraping across a chalkboard with no end in sight. It's a perpetual scratch. No escape, just time to hope you can soothe and recover if it will just relent. And I worry every time, will it stop? Is this time forever? My anxiety, of course, goes through the roof and it probably worsens it even more. The phantom pain manifests often in three extreme ways. Itches emerge everywhere, sporadically across my body, and scratching them rarely relieves them. They just move. It is a scratch and scrape myself to distract until it is enough and it stops, often resulting in broken skin. It's the only hope I have sometimes to put an end to the torment or headaches and migraines that follow any slight injury or emotional stress. The headaches can leave me in the hospital, they're so bad. And the last, overwhelming anxiety and a sense of oppression and threat. There's nothing that can be escaped, it's catastrophe. So imagine, not only are brain systems not working right, 
but I have an internal freakout system that is on overdrive. It does that over all failures, all physical pain, anything that is upsetting, and I can't control the freakouts, they control me. I am glad to write down my memories and I share them because I fear one day even these memories will have been stolen from me as my mind decays and dies. Despite how hard it is to keep writing, I will push myself to do so. I intend to keep going because my waning memories may be lost irrecoverably someday. And so I need to write them down now before they are forgotten to history. Perhaps I will read my own story someday and wonder who that man was and how did he accomplish so much? How was he such a good person? In writing Hell Difficulty, I am preserving my heart, my soul, my legacy. I am preserving me.